Facebook portion. All right, now we should be good. All right, sir. Um, how are you handling this new normal? How am I handling the new normal? I feel like I, we're supposed to start with that really strange podcast live webinar sort of overly dramatic, like, hey, I, I, can't, I, can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't do that. So I'm not going to do that. You know, I love you though. Um, it's okay. I think there's, there's a, you know, truth of the matter is there's going to be a, a delay for most of us in terms of when we feel all of the emotional energy that's actually slowly building up in our bodies because it yeah. is, yeah. you know, and, and some of us are, are, uh, occupied for a majority of the day so there's no room to feel it and other people are perhaps just uh, distracting themselves with other um, sometimes positive and not so positive um, habits you know what I mean so and then there's the precious few who seem to be able to, in this lifetime to feel feelings as they as they actually rise you know but that's the minority of us so I think I'm doing okay I'm, I'm certainly making some some uh I'm opening up some doors in, in the mansion that is my soul that haven't been opened in a while. You know yeah. what I mean? So getting back into exercise for the sake of cele celebrating my health, which is a cool thing instead of trying to prove it or earn it. Yes. Um, it's just, uh, that's been a lot of fun eating. Well, I'm no longer a vegetarian. Um, I Good for you. I, I did. <laughs> 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 that was an interesting experiment, but I got sick twice and I never get sick. So I imagine my immune system was not doing all that well. Yeah. Um, I have uh, also discovered something about myself, which is I am deeply in love with anything that comes in a bag is salty and dry. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like in a, in a past life I may have been uh, a Dorito or uh, <laughs> or some or some derivative of a Dorito, because uh, that stuff just brings me joy. Um, so that's about what it, that's about it. How you doing, brother? Man, I am well. I am well. So I have decided to double down on the things I can't control. And, mm. you know, accept the things I can't control. So I've prioritized health in a way that I haven't in like years, you know, because I spent mm. 18 months recovering from like seven surgeries and dude, now like I'm good. So we've got this whole fitness thing we're doing with the school where we have jujitsu movement classes, mobility classes, lifting classes, yoga classes, and I'm doing all of them, which yes. is kind of like built in accountability partner. And then just like you, so now I'm running now. I'm running every mm -hmm. morning. And in the same way, just celebrating, like just running through the park and taking it all in mm -hmm. and, you know, not not having the criticizing voice in my head while I'm doing it. It's mm -hmm. just like, you know, it's a celebration of I have the opportunity to do this. Yes. This is a, you know, I'm in a sports car and just like enjoying right. the job. So no no tracking software? Oh, no, I'm tracking. I have to. Are you? <laughs> so, here, so here's where I'm at. I called yesterday. I called my very good friend, uh, Steve Ziegler, who he's you know he's run multiple Ironmans, like he's mm. stud. And I was like, dude, here's my goal. By the time I'm in my early 50s, I want to be in the kind of shape where I run a marathon a day, just because that's where my body's at, and I want to. So I'm 17 years out from that goal. What should I do? So we're very simply just we have a base mileage going up 10% each week. And uh, I'm doing it in a way where I'm not looking for gratification or enforcing my ego. It's just, this is something I really want to do. It looks like a cool, fun thing that gets me outside. So, so far I've had a very healthy relationship to it. That's good. And so I, I yeah, so again, you know, we've, we've said this before, but you know, words fall short, right? They're just signposts. They don't really represent the experience that they point to, but they're all we have much, mm -hmm. much of the time. They're all we have. So the way that you're explaining your relationship right now, the way that I've been sort of visualizing it in my life recently is that we are all born, you know, moments ago, I talked about opening a door in the, in the mansion that is my soul. Like we're all, we're all born with a certain plot of, of land that is ours in this life. And I don't mean, you know, dirt, space. And I think what you're doing is you're choosing to, to walk the boundaries of your property. Yeah. So just, just so that you can see what it looks like from that point, like, so you don't need to camp out in the far left-hand corner of your acreage, mm -hmm. but you would be wise to go out there and see what it looks like. Yes. And that's, if that's the feeling, so much of, of what decides whether or not the behaviors we're engaged in are a uh, cleansing of karma or a cultivation of more of it is really how it feels, you know? And if it yeah. feels free, if it feels like there's no resistance, it's likely cultivating wisdom. 
Mm -hmm. And so it's really hard to judge what any human being is doing from the outside as right or wrong, good or bad, wise or confused. Because what ultimately determines for that human the usefulness of their own behavior is really how it feels. But, you know, now you got to talk about how accurate, how accurately do most of us feel our feelings? Yes. You know what I mean? Because it's not, you know, what I would have told you felt right 20 years ago is very different today. So, you know, every conversation you and I have, I think it, it feels right to me because it's grounded in this honest confession that we don't ultimately know. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that we can't know but we can still have conversations. Um, but at my age and my stage, I don't want to have conversations that deepen my confusion. <laughs> yes. It just, I just don't want to, do you know what I mean? Yeah. There was a time in my life that maybe I had to, or, and I probably still do at times, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing is, nothing is either or. Um, but it, there's a feeling to it. And if, if it feels that way to you, then I mean, damn dude, you know, people who are six foot eight would really, really suffer if they tried to be six foot six. They would really suffer, right? So mm -hmm. you got to let your biology speak its language. And if your biology is one that says, you know, run, forest, run, then you should do that. Because um, I'm doing it too, as I said to you, which I didn't think I'd ever do again. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's um, uniplanar, it's repetitive, it's high, it's high um, compression, like a, all these bad biomechanical things about it, but spiritually it feels wonderful. And it, it's meditative. It's the best yeah. meditation that I've come up with. It's just, no. it's meditation on steroids because when you're sitting quietly in a room and the thoughts through the clouds pass slowly, when you're running and exhausted in pain, those clouds come flying at you, yeah. rationalizing all the reasons you should stop. So it's just like, if, if each time you return your attention back to your breath is a rep, you get so many more reps when it's physically demanding. And so I'll do, I'll go for a 20 minute run and I'll get done and man, I'll feel like in a different state of consciousness and I'll, I'll hum there for like half an hour because yeah. of the struggle. Yeah. I, I think, well, I don't, I don't know if it's entirely because of the struggle. I know the struggle is a part of it, but I, I sort of have been witness because I'm doing a lot of work now with some, with some really, really sort of sacred people in the rowing community, which is what we know of to be the most painful physical sport you can engage in. And mm -hmm. by every biological measure there is, there's nothing more painful than rowing a 2000 meter race to complete and total exhaustion. Yeah. Um, and so you see the pendulum swinging and people talk about like embracing the suck, like every, like I'm wise, wise skepticism is, mm -hmm. is the driver for me when I'm in a, in an enlightened space, it's wise skepticism that anything that a lot of people talk about as being the real, really good thing, <laughs> you, you, you might want to just slow down. There's probably something else in there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do agree that the struggle is part of it, but I think that there's also a, um, there's also something about running that makes having the meditative meditative experience easier because it seems that the amount of energy for me that is dedicated to this experience of what we call volitional movement, which is a very curious experience, right? Cause how much of it is really volitional? I don't really have to will my legs to move much at all. They just do it on their own. So there's mind them. <laughs> yeah, it's weird, right? So that, but there's so, the engagement of whatever that part of our, of our experience is called the will it occupying it with all of the, um, things that come with running balance uh, visual feedback auditory feedback the respiratory feedback it seems to quiet a part of the mind yes so it, it actually makes part of what is meditative about it easier that's why i know a lot of really high strung people who don't meditate but they run man that's fair so, focus on your breath you when you're running your breath is very loud yeah, a lot of it. Just, there's just there's something about it that's different. That's why I think it's really important to call it a meditative event as opposed to meditation. That, mm -hmm. that from what I've gathered, and, I'm, and maybe someday I'll feel bold enough, and you may be bold enough already to change that definition. Um, the two forms of meditation that I've come to appreciate as, as the most valid as meditation in and of itself are seated and walking. Mm -hmm. So walking meditation does what you're, what you're experiencing in running meditation really well because it's, it simply makes meditation more difficult because now you have this idea of being present in the body and aware of breath, but all the movement brings up so many different opportunities for distractions because of the kind of movement walking meditation is, especially if you're doing it on a retreat where you're 
four feet, well, nowadays, at least six feet behind someone and six feet in front of someone walking around a, a meditation room. It's a very strange experience the first time you do walking meditation. Mm -hmm. And they basically did it to relieve people of a lot of the physical pain that comes with seated meditation. So they would sit Absolutely. and they would get up and they would walk and then they would sit and get up and walk. And so I, I do, I do know for a fact that I, and that I can agree with you from, from my experience that my best what running does for me is it invites my body into the parasympathetic nervous system like nothing else, especially if, because it's a steady state experience, right? So it's not like all out. It's not this like exhaustive experience. It's a steady state experience. So as a result of being a steady state of experience, the body begins to feel safer. You go into parasympathetic arousal and I have my absolutely most creative stuff come to me yes. Yes. when I'm doing, when I'm doing cardiovascular activity by far. And for about an hour, for about an hour afterwards. Yeah, right. Fact, right. After my run, when I turn it into a walk, which is like the most sacred part, where I just walk another quarter mile or a half mile or a full mile, mm. that's like I'm, I just get flooded by this wisdom that I don't know where the hell it's coming from, but it's it's really cool, really yeah, cool. That's amazing. So using, so I don't want to say that you you use the running as the meditative experience because then you're using it toward an end and in a kind mm -hmm. of way it's lost, right? You're mm -hmm. allowing it to unfold rather than pursuing that. Mm -hmm. um, dude, I, I've found at least that I find the value in just the callousing of the mind because mm -hmm. if you don't use something, it atrophies. And it's so easy to kind of let sloth and torpor and mental weakness kind of sink in because we have nothing vying for our effort. So at least for me personally, doing a run first thing in the morning makes like the day's laundry list of to do's so much more approachable because it's like my, my will muscles are elevated and turned on. Mm -hmm. They stay elevated all day. I think it's the, the, the will muscles combined with um, a reactivation of presence because the only work we can do is the work we can do now. So mm -hmm. the, the great, the great myth, the thing that I work on with so many of my coaching clients is this feeling we have of sort of urgency of for many people, it's actually a mild sense of impending doom that people have cultivated as a driver to keep going. It doesn't help you get more done that you're only going to get done what you can get done today. There's a limit to that because we are limited. Um, so now the question is, how do we get the most done possible with the greatest sense of ease and, and the greatest accuracy? Does having that sense of urgency or impending doom facilitate that? And it, of course, does not. But we don't know how else to do it. We don't know how to work without feeling like we have to work. And, yeah. you're, and, you're, and you're discovering that because yeah. you can, well, because it doesn't have to be work. As Alan Watts says, you know, the greatest pianists in the world don't work the piano. They play it. Mm -hmm. So is there a way for us to play work, to play being the owner of a jiu-jitsu school, to play being an executive coach? Play it. It's just a different attitude. A person wouldn't play the piano if they played it harder. That's not it. That's, so don't work harder. Why do we have that word harder as always the driver as a measure of how committed someone is. Mm -hmm. You know, the ocean doesn't ocean harder. If you try to breathe harder, it doesn't make breathing better. So let's take out the harder piece. And I think that's what it invites you and I both into is that running, it, ex it exhausts some of the sort of negative karma that we've built up unknowingly over the last 24 hours. Yeah. I think that's one of the things it does. It invites us into a constant state of presence because without it, you're likely to fall <laughs> or whatever is going to happen, especially where you run on trails, I'm sure. So it really, so like when I ride my road bike, it just immediately invites presence because if you're not, you're going to die. So mm -hmm. it invites this presence, it exhausts this negative karma, it excites the will. And so when it's over, you have less negative karma, a higher sense of your own will and capacity and a greater degree of presence. And you combine all that stuff and you get a tremendous amount of stuff done and it doesn't feel like it's very hard at all. Yeah. Yeah. That's ideal, isn't it? It's perfect. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, I, uh, I don't know if we talked about this last time, but maybe I was talking about it with Pete McHugh where maybe it was like three weeks ago, I was cooking an egg and bro, I, I, I flipped it with every ounce of my being in the perfect way where nothing else existed but me and that egg. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, I was so proud of that moment later on, but in that moment, it was so beautiful. It was like nothing else existed but me and the egg in that moment. And it was like, that was more meditative. That was me playing 
the chef yeah, yeah. than any That's act what, of sitting down and like trying to focus on my breath, you know, just being yeah. fully immersed in the act. When it's all that, you know, if you read a, any one of Thich Nhat Hanh's books, if you read any one of them, you've read half of all of them. Yes, they're all the same. Because, it, because half of it is all the same. But he keeps coming back to washing the dishes. Yeah. So what you what you experienced in that moment is, is literally, and once you have that experience, and you had it to the degree that you actually noticed you were having it, that you actually talked about having it, so you really had it to a significant degree, you now know the difference between what it feels like to be awake mm -hmm. and asleep. Mm -hmm. So you flipped a thousand eggs in your life. Yeah. And what was so different about that one is that you were awake. That that in, in Thich Nhat Hanh actually created what's called engaged Buddhism, which is like, how do you bring this this sense of being and presence into everyday activities? And that's what you did. I mean, it's it, you can do it every time you take a drink. Like, and and once you've done it for one egg flip, you realize how rarely you do it. Yes. And I just took a drink from my Fiji bottle a few moments ago and I didn't do it. I didn't really, you know, feel it in my hand, the, the miracle of what it is. Also, if you feel it really deeply, you'll feel a little bit of a sense of heartache because you know that it's really not good for us, <laughs> this plastic. You know, it's not, it's convenient. You know what I mean? It's like holding a, a weapon that was used to kill someone a thousand years ago. You'll sense something about it that's like sad. Like, oh my God, this thing's powerful. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? but it still has really good water in it with a little bit of green, green tea extract for me. And there's a way to engage. And it's just, it, 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 it involves a certain level of consciousness that is not for most of us, our default operating system. So in my mind, right, if you can be say awake for a minute a day, that was, mm -hmm. that was a heck of a minute. And the goal mm -hmm. to, put more opportunities for that mindfulness where if I'm awake for a minute today, and again, this is the Western achiever talking, right? If I'm awake for a minute today, I want to be awake for two, two minutes. minutes tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. And, and you keep going. But what do you use as far as cues for that mindfulness? Like, dude, I've thought about like just getting like tattoos on my hands where I can just see it in everything I do. Yeah. No, yeah. How do you cultivate an environment that cultivates that type of wakefulness? There, there are, there are, so I once had a person ask me a question at a, at a workshop or a seminar, you know, how do you remind yourself to breathe? And I, I, and I just put sort of paused and smiled, not in a patronizing way, but sort of in a, in a parental way, because the person was younger than I was. And um, I realized how, how amusing it is, you know, that I was able to tell a person that you can't remind yourself to do something. Cause if you remember to remind yourself, you've already remembered. So there's no, there's no way to remind yourself to do something that, yeah. that there's, that it's one of those opportunities where you realize that you're really just waiting to let things happen as they need to happen. Now, how can we set reminders? Mm -hmm. Two way, two ways. One is, is, is in our circumstance, like one of the only, one of the only posters I believe is useful to give anybody that I, that I, I'm, I'm invested in, in the growth, in, in the growth and development of and for is a poster that says breathe, just put it on every wall in the, in every, every room mm. so that you just see it and you're just reminded because breath is the one and quickest way to flip an egg because yes. you're always doing it. You're not always flipping an egg, but you're always breathing. So you set external reminders. The other really cool thing to do is to take advantage of basic behaviorism, which means begin to create a relationship between the act of breath of mindful breath in response to some other internal event. And the ideal ones to match it to are the ones that we had previously viewed as derogatory. So what I mean by that is if you recognize at some point that you're experiencing anxiety, which in and of itself is a form of awakening, because mm -hmm. like you can experience anxiety and then you can recognize you're experiencing anxiety. And prior to recognizing that you were experiencing anxiety, you were still experiencing anxiety. You just didn't recognize it. So it was actually building and building and building until it hit to hit whatever threshold it needed to hit before you went, Hey, wait a second. I'm experiencing anxiety. In that moment, we have an opportunity to sort of resist our experience of anxiety to judge it, which is what traditional psychology would tell you to do, right? Like it's a yeah. sign that something's wrong. It's a mental illness. We need to get away from this. No, I think it's a vehicle that as we recognize we're experiencing anxiety, if we use that, as the internal reminder to go to breath, then what was once seen as a derogatory part of our experience actually becomes a vehicle to enlightenment. Yes. That we can use our own uh, weaknesses, dark sides. It's our own mud, to be honest with you, 
and it is from the mud that the lotus is grown. So this is how you turn what traditional psychology calls a disease or a disorder into what Buddhism sees as the mud from which the lotus is born. You don't want to extract the mud because then you won't have any damn flowers. Yeah. The point is how do you recognize the mud for what it really is and allow it to speak in the voice it was intended to speak with, which is to simply wake us up. Mm -hmm. Just there to wake us up. You know this, and you know this as someone who's done as much jujitsu as you have. You know, and I've learned it in ways outside of jujitsu that there is a softness to wisdom. There is always a softness to it. That once you get hard, even though it might produce results in the short term that appear to be effective, yeah. you're just you're just cultivating what we would call negative karma. You're cultivating confusion that it's mm -hmm. going to have to be handled at some point because like, it's not. It it might look like it's working. You know, like smoking crack might change your mood temporarily but it's cultivating a certain consequence that is going to have to be experienced yeah whatever that is you you brought up you know adding to the confusion and i remember you and i have talked extensively about our relationships to social media and our own inner resistance to that but willingness mm -hmm. to dive in mm -hmm. and i can tell you for me my biggest problem with it is that when i am somewhere i'm usually there by myself and as soon as I start thinking about what can I put on social media, I'm bringing my, my persona, right? And my ego, and I'm entertaining thousands of other people in that space. And I've sort of robbed myself of the privacy of that moment. And I think that's the thing that I dislike the most about it. And, you know, out of the path that I've chosen, at least for right now, I need to be very active on social media. But I have found that one, I do not like to have to entertain things, even if they're people I love that are outside of this moment. And that's what social media is. And then two, that idea of adding to the confusion, like, bro, I know when I go on Instagram, I am just delaying whatever it is I need to do. You know, like Gary V had a great post. It was like, whatever you came on Instagram to get motivated for to go do, just go do that thing. Like mm -hmm. I never come away from it filled up. I never come away from it closer really to God or myself or anything. So you now have been very active on social media. What has been your, why are you active on social media? How are you managing your internal relationship to it? And how are you not adding to the confusion by being on it? All right. So you, you, you brought up some really good stuff and it's, it's important to, to pay homage the simple fact that wisdom is created in in communion so that is this conversation between you and i that has cultivated whatever wisdom for lack of a better term i'm, I'm about to share um all right so there's a difference between being active on social media and putting content on social media mm -hmm. so i have been doing both but i'll get to that in a second i've been putting a lot of content on social media but the content was created the same way you and i are creating this content which for me feels like a very intimate Mm -hmm. honest conversation between two people that other people may or may not be watching. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm really not very much aware of that, nor, nor do I care to be right now because it, it would then become artificial. This is really just you and I talking yeah. and we happen to be recording it and sharing that conversation. So this has not, this experience has not invited me outside of the current moment. It hasn't at all. And neither did filming any of those clips because I filmed them with my videographer, usually in my home. Mm -hmm. More as a diary than anything else, Chris. I didn't know what I was going to do with those clips. I just had this relationship with Andy Stroll, who's this gifted videographer. And he, he really, similar to what you do, invites this higher level of, of, of being and, and sensing to come up in me. And, and we just create some really cool stuff together. And that's all I saw it as. And then when COVID hit, he was like, dude, we got we to gotta put this stuff out there. My reluctance to putting it out there I've, I've figured out, I've verbalized it earlier this week in another conversation was that, see, when I got sober, like AA doesn't advertise and it doesn't advertise specifically because you ain't going to get it. If you need to, if you need to be sold on it, you're not going to get it. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't want to sell people. I don't want to suggest to people um, that anything needs to be done or that you need my help or it, I just don't see the universe as unfolding that way. Yeah, I, I, I have, however, learned um, that there is, of course, very real injustice in this world and there are very serious degrees of suffering that we can influence. And I think we are right to do that. Um, 
And I have learned that the quality of the invitation does in fact influence the number of people that RSVP. And now the invitation can have many different qualities, right? For some people, if the invitation just has a light dusting of cocaine on it, and when people open it, they don't realize that they get high and they're like, oh, this is gonna be a great party. And they go to the party. So maybe more people went to the party, but was it really an invitation to a higher level of living or was it just offering people um, satisfaction and all of us have parts of us that, that would like satisfaction that isn't necessarily going to propel us forward, which is fine, right? You always hear me say, like, you know, have a cupcake if it gets too heavy, like whatever. It, it's not, it doesn't, that's okay. Um, but I think in the case of, 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 of assisting people on this path to whatever degree we're capable, um, the invitation and the quality of the invitation is important. So I do believe that in this lifetime, I have been given the ability to communicate and use words in a way that allows people an opportunity to have moments of awareness that are somewhat unique. And so I do get a sense of, of joy from that, almost like a musician does creating music. We would never tell a musician not to create music. That's what they're here to do. And this seems to be what I'm here to do and same for you. So I do it for that reason. Now, being, you know, being involved in social media, when I'm on it and I'm trying to comment back to the people who are commenting and checking how many people are, that's a really uncomfortable experience for me. I don't, I don't see that as, as really very useful at all, but um, I'm, I'm managing that. I'm watching myself get pulled into it. I'm feeling the feelings that come with and it. And you play social media, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it's, um, and it's also, I mean, I thought about, you know, cause there's also still a very rebellious side of me that can be, hurtful to myself and hurtful to others and it's, that still exists you know and last week i i had to pause before putting a, a post together which i still might at some point which says listen if, if, if the wisdom that we're looking for is capable of being put in a single slide with a pretty picture <laughs> we're not going anywhere like it's yeah. I mean, but that's only partially true because you know the the single greatest piece of wisdom i could ever give anyone is let go it's two words but what does that do yeah yeah it's the truth you want to derive the wisdom that you bring to it so it's yeah. like someone who can hear it doesn't need to hear it. And someone who needs to hear it can't hear it. More often than not, right? So I think that's why, you know, positioning myself as an entertainer, which I've stolen from Alan Watts, is it's the most comfortable position for me because it, it, it's, it, it's, it, it softens the whole thing. That Alan Watts' comparison to, to music, he continually used music as an example. That there's mm -hmm. something very special about music, arguably more so than physical movement, the martial arts, or meditation. That music and its effect on the brain um, only, I don't know why I say that, because we live in the West and everything has to have, you know, the brain, if the brain's involved, then it's real. Like, you know, yeah. but as an organ, it's a curious organ for sure. And music, no, we know music excites more parts of the brain than any other form of stimuli. So when music is on, we don't feel the need to get to the end of the song. We don't see that as the goal. We see each note as having its own purpose. Mm. So there are environments that invite us into that level of being that's yeah. really a, an enlightened state of being. Uh, that, that if you were, you know, if the last note of the song was the most important, then we would just play it. Yet we live our lives very differently. You know, we live our lives as if, no, none of this matters. It's just the end that matters. The black belt matters, or the marathon matters, or the promotion matters, or the house purchase matters. And we overemphasize the final note. Yeah. And then when we get there, we want to start the song over again. Like, so if there's a way to just ease into your current moment experience, and I know when we say that to high achievers, they freak out. What do you mean? You mean like lighten up? Like, you know, I'll get lazy. All right. I know that that's what you think. And you're going to have to go through your own experience of that and go through the fear of that because it's just an illusion. It's not true. I work with the most you know, gifted rowers in the world. And the second they actually learn what I mean by lighten up, they get faster. So I have all the research I need. It's not going to make you slower, but it, it's a, it's a distinct feeling, you know, that I have now in this conversation with you, that I could lose in a moment. Mm -hmm. I couldn't lose it in a moment and get caught up again. Cause I have that stream of karma that runs through me that shit, I'll grab a hold of the end just like anybody else will. You know, yeah. You yeah. made the confession before about the, you know, doing, you know, getting, getting, um, uh, was it was it one mile to two miles? No, it was one egg to two eggs. Whatever going up, it was, it was, yeah, go yeah, ten percent yeah. a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah ten, right, right. So there's all that, and and I don't, I don't 
I had, I had a long conversation with the coaches of one of the teams I work with about goal setting. And listen, it's an, it's an, it's inevitable. It's a part of athletics specifically. Listen, we have a race on May 10th of 2021 that we want to be really ready for. Okay. So that is a goal. Now, whether or not people experience that goal as expectation or intention mm -hmm. is the greatest, is the greatest measure of a team's culture. Cause we want it to come from intention, which is an inside out. It's like the difference between something that glows and something that has a spotlight put on it. Expectation is external and it brings with it a ton of unwanted stuff. Mm -hmm. In, intention is very different. Yeah. Very, very different. Like you're running intentionally now. You used to run from expectation. That's, that's the difference. Um, yeah. And I, mean, I don't mean to point to you. I'm, I'm still in that same experience myself. Um, so I'm involved in social media. I'm reluctant because I can see that it's... I don't yeah. like to sell what I do. But like you, I am in a business where if I don't have some some relevance in social media, then people who are potentially interested in me but have a segment of their mentality that says, listen, if a person doesn't have a social media presence, they're probably a fraud. And they see that my social media presence is lacking and then they categorize me that way and then I don't get a chance to help them. Yeah, yeah. Right, so I'm doing the, the least amount of specific work, just the same way we used to communicate to people with exercise. You always wanna do this least amount of specific work to facilitate growth. Because any more work isn't gonna facilitate more growth, it's just gonna take more time to get the growth you would have received because yeah. now the, the system has to heal more. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the same thing. So I'm trying to do the least amount of social media necessary for the desired result. Man, it's funny you say that because my relationship to reading has changed so much. Mm -hmm. uh, as I am moving in a place where I'm consuming less and just being more like, dude, I'm going through a Ram Dass phase. I'll read two, three pages a morning and that's all I can take in. I need to stop. I saw you posted that. that. Yeah. yeah, I need mm -hmm. to go work on that. It, I'm looking for what is the minimum viable product to set my right, you know, space and frame mm -hmm. of mind for the rest mm -hmm. of the day. And it's been funny to watch my relationship to that change because, say, five years ago, books were trophies. Even Amen. if I wasn't telling anyone about it, it was just like, uh -huh. yeah, I crushed that book, you know? And now I'm just like, dude, you're going to read every day for the rest of your life. There's no, like, victories here. It's you read and then you die. So I don't view them as separate books now. It's just I'm reading now and then I'm not reading now, you know? That's, um, that's that's a great way of, of putting it that you just, and some of the best books I've ever read actually have pauses written into them. They actually mm -hmm. tell, tell the reader, I walk away now. And it's, again, that's one of the things I, I value so much about Buddhism is that wisdom in Buddhism is not made available to everybody. You can't go like to the library of Buddhism and just take out the final chapter. Dude, like, I should have not have read Buddhism in my twenties. Cause I remember I came to you <laughs> and I was like, all that. right, doc, here's what I'm going to do this year. I'm going to win a jiu-jitsu world championship <laughs> and I'm not going to care about it. And you just looked at me, you were like, so I think the goal. <laughs> I, I couldn't hear it. I wasn't ready for it. Now, a decade later, I'm about to turn 34 and I think I know what Buddhism's talking about. I mean, I hope I look back at now when I'm 44 and I'm like, yeah, I uh, know, you know. I'm, well, sure. I'm, 40, I'm 49. So if you want to have a glimpse into that at some point, we can have a conversation, but it's a, yeah. it's a, it's an incredible, um, opportunity. Aging is a, an incredible opportunity to view your, your home from different spaces in the yard. Mm -hmm. Not everybody accepts that opportunity. Some people seem to just stay on the porch yeah. and, ma and maintain the same view. But my life has not allowed me that luxury of sitting, of sitting on the porch, right? My, my, my life's been like, my ass has gotten kicked into other people's yards. You know what I mean? So I've been, <laughs> I've been, I've been forced to see the, 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 my house from many different angles, which mm -hmm. is really, I think that seems to me to be one of the root causes of a, of a certain kind of wisdom. It's just a, a, a multitude of experiences. Um, having the opportunity to experience as many flavors of ice cream um, really does make you more of a connoisseur. Yeah, yeah. And man, it really, aging, it really does. Aging will finally allow you to free yourself of the Western trap of achieving and not being enough. Because as you, when you're young, it's like you have the potential to play all the games. 
which mm-hmm. means you have the potential to succeed in all mm-hmm. the games. Well, you and did. You age, not, everybody, not everybody does, but you did. Yes, you did. I, yes. I appreciate it. As you age and those games, you know, are no longer in potential anymore and you have fewer and fewer options, you're forced to sit with that. And in reading that mm-hmm. Ramdas book, he talks about, you know, I'm now, this was at like the end of his life. And he was like, you know, I'm basically confined to my body. I'm dependent because he had a really bad stroke where half his body was paralyzed. And he's like, what a great opportunity to work on my meditation. I can't do anything (laughs) else, you know? (laughs) And I sent you that little passage today where he's like, Uh, you know, I realized that when I identify with my ego, a stroke happened to me. But when mm -hmm. I identify with my soul and the witness behind the ego, I watched the stroke happen and like his, his mentor um, Maharishi said that, you know, let go of your anger, let go of your frustration, whatever it is, don't consciously work through it. Don't analyze it. Just let it go. Let go, let go, let go, let go. Because if, 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 if you look, if you look what Ram Dass's mentor did a lot of, it was lie on a wooden bench. That's all he did. He just lied there. That's yeah. what he did. He just lied yeah. there. <laughs> I love hearing how he talks about it when Ram Dass says, like, you know, look, I was a psychology professor at Harvard. I met Timothy Leary. We took all the drugs we possibly could to stay high. And then I realized the goal wasn't to stay high. It was to be free. But then he goes to India and he's like, you know, every time I would get high, I would come down. And I met a being in Maharaji who he's high all the time. Mm. And he's high all the time because he's free. And, and mm. I if there if i have a goal now it's like i would hope to be that content and at peace with the present moment to allow a space for people to see the divine within themselves and feel loved and, and you know reflect that love toward them you know and, and i and i i invite you and it's an experience that i have not um taken advantage of or enjoyed as much as i really do have access to and i um, I ought to be more allegiant to the traditions of 12-step recovery by not mentioning what fellowship I'm speaking of, because that's really the right thing to do. But in 12-step recovery, um, I was afforded the opportunity to, to be around people, and I want you know you to hear this the way I know, I know that you will, but anybody else who's listening, to be around the people who were everything you thought you didn't want to be, as ugly as it sounds. They're unattractive, uneducated, um, underachieving, um, and they're, they're, they don't have any money, and yet they have a spiritual presence, a strength, and a happiness that was incomparable to my own. And so mm-hmm. it's not about, because all those labels I just put upon them, of course, were I manufactured them. They're not real. Yeah. Attractive and unattractive are not real, and wealthy and poor are not real. I mean, there are some very real elements to that when we talk about people who just can't get enough of what they need to live. That's not what I'm mm-hmm. talking about. But you know, my identity was so wrapped up in being the most of these things. Um, it's really important because I think that there is a very real um, uh, confusion being disseminated in what, what is now being called two things, which I, I, I enjoy both terms uh, immensely. One is success porn and the other one is uh, motivational speakers. <laughs> like this, this this whole this whole movement that it's like, I, I just watched a clip of a dude and talking about how like, he found that you know the, the it was, and it's this is where he's at you know that, that it was all about finding out who in the business was willing and and then you 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 pay attention to them and so like if I was in the audience I'd be like so basically you just do what's easy, mm-hmm. is that leadership? So you just lead the people willing to be led? That's not leadership. Mm-hmm. That's that's direction. That's not. There's nothing extraordinary about that. It's about creating an environment where things happen that could not and would not have happened had you not been involved if you want to consider yourself an artist. Yeah. Now, if you just want to consider yourself a director, then so be it. But you see how like, we justify it because it works better? That's the, that's the motivation behind almost everything that harms us in this world. <laughs> it's, well, it seems to be working, so do it more. Like, No, it, 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 it's more complicated than that. And it's really important to spend time with people who don't want to do any of the shit you want to do. <laughs> who don't who don't do who don't do any of it well and are completely okay with it or they're not okay with it but if we can watch and learn so that the possibility exists that our perspective is expanded in the truest sense of the word so that when I'm in the presence of a person who's a supporting of a politician that I'm opposed to and living a life that I'm opposed to and I can understand 
then I've, then I've woken up. That's the idea. It's like how we've lost touch, Chris, with the fact that the base, the base level of politics ought to be that everyone is required to argue their opponent's point of view. It should be an absolute requirement. Because yeah. once you try to do it, you start to go, oh, oh. That kind of makes sense. That makes sense. I, and now, oh my God, all of a sudden we have understanding, right? That's the power. Mm. If we can't do that, so now let's internalize that. Wouldn't that be cool if we could do that for ourselves? Like argue from the point of view of your lust. Argue from the point of view of your laziness. Argue, like listen to the voice that's behind them as opposed to demonizing them. Yeah, yeah. Because then, the, then you're at war with yourself. And there's two big school, schools of thought. One is like you take the Stephen Pressfield approach of labeling it resistance and it's your enemy and you're attacking it, but then you're attacking mm-hmm. part of you. Mm-hmm. And then the other approach is to look at it with love, you know, as like a parent or not that you're above it, but because it's part of you, mm-hmm. but just to accept that as like, Oh, that's me too. Yeah. And, and, and then that's the first step and there's many steps, right? But the ultimate step then is to begin to recognize. So the nature of forgive, forgiveness, by the way, lives in that experience. The, the true nature of forgiveness lives in the, uh, the experience of bearing witness to an element of yourself that you find unacceptable and then recognizing that it wasn't, it's not your fault. Yeah. Like, it's not my fault. I didn't ask for this. I didn't ask. I'm so sorry. And then you're, you're apologizing to yourself and then you actually learn forgiveness. And then when you see another human being act like an asshole, you're like, oh, I totally understand (laughs) i totally understand you know so that when people make confessions to me the last thing you ever have to worry about me doing is going seriously like that's not helpful (laughs) you know and i've actually made a couple two in my life where you go oh yeah you know like yes i totally get that i totally get and then once i feel understood you actually provided an experience for me with the power of understanding, which is an immeasurable unseen power that as a result of the power of true heartfelt understanding that you offered me created an experience for me to bear witness to elements of my own capacity that I was before that unaware of that you provided the stimulation for growth by simply understanding. me. Mm. That's it. Mm. That's all that's required. But now we all know the truth about how well we really understand other people and the difference yeah. between understanding them and not is that feeling of mm-hmm. how could he that stupid mo- that that thing that is not understanding yeah, and in that moment that person that you're now rejecting becomes your guru you know they become 100%. the vehicle for your awakening it, if you're a yeah, perfect 100%. barometer 100 percent, and it's also heartbreaking what bothers me all right, well, it's, heart, it's also heartbreaking, right? Because you literally have to be bothered, right? You have to be like, oh my God, like this, this is what it feels like to grow up, to be growing up. Like, Dude, <laughs> that's the best thing you've given me is uh, the, the feeling of sadness and negative emotion. And we've talked yeah. about it <laughs> I, built I, in, that <laughs> I built in my, you know, my entire twenties was like, how can I create a wall of a positive experience <laughs> where I'm always at like a 9.9 and I can do that. I'm pretty good at it, uh-huh. but it, it's not a 10, you know, no. it, I'm missing no. part of it. I'm only staying in part of the yard as you described. 100%. And at least what I'm realizing as I age, you know, that I, I am not trying to be the best jujitsu athlete anymore. I pursued that for a long time and it was an amazing spiritual raft. Mm-hmm. Now I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be right. That's it. We can stop right mm-hmm. there. I'm trying mm-hmm. to be and to be, I am just walking aimlessly around the edges of the yard. And that means that I can't stay at any one point too long. Mm. You know, the mastery of one thing, like tunneling yourself down that one thing. I want to do that in being. That's the only final place to reside that much attention. Everything else is like, dude, it's hard to balance all the bank accounts of your health, your business, your relationships, your passions, everything else. It's, to deposit into one you withdraw from another and i just i try to take it like week by week like all right did i neglect anything last week i'll tend mm-hmm. to that this week you know mm-hmm. and, and all right there's some people who will start using those planners that they sell to do that that's not my style like i don't i don't you know i i'm more comfortable and i and i think i i do better work i'm more useful to others perhaps the greatest barometer of any of any decision we make, right? I'm, I'm more useful to others when I 
when I just ease up on that department? Because I think it's important to, to, to note that you can do, you know, whatever you can do. You know, there are people who stay at a 9.5 through the use of, of drugs and alcohol for decades. And it seems to work. Yeah. You know, you can, you can choose to, I have a septic tank in my house. I could choose to go four or five, six, seven years without having the damn thing emptied. And it'll work until it doesn't work. Mm. And so, you know, you and I can talk about, you know, if you feel like you're at a 9.5 on whatever scale that is, you can, can you deny the, the fact that the septic tank is still filling up, that there still are emotions of sadness and loss and fear? Because if they're not a part of your life, we, we should probably talk about how much value there is. Because if you have value in your life, there must be fear and sadness. Mm -hmm. Because those come with value. Those emotions, you know, sadness says that something of value has been lost because you will lose it. Yeah. So if when you lose it, there's no sense of, of loss, then there was really no sense of value. You never had it. Yeah. You never had it. So the truth is, if, if it feels that way, you have to ask, you know, where's that septic tank, man? And what's it getting filled with? You know, and, and it seems like for many of us, it's just over and over again, realizing there has been a septic tank overflowing and we just couldn't smell it because it became the norm for us. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the, the, the most freeing, great word, not a lot of words that, that, that do a really good job of pointing to the place that they point. Freedom is one of them. There seems to be a lot of freedom and also a lot of heartbreak when you realize that in this lifetime, there are people who have grown so um, numb to the smell of their own septic tank overflowing that they will never do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's heartbreaking, dude. Yeah. But now, it, and, and people say, well, how do you say that? Listen, Chris, I don't give a shit what you do. You will never be in the NBA. You will never. Be. So if I can make a statement like that, then it's also possible that there's other things you and I will never do. Yeah. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Why have we, why have we grown so resistant to that? That it's not, you're not meant to do everything. You're meant to do this. Mm -hmm. This, this is the ride. You know, I, I came across a piece of wisdom from Alan Watts that I wanted to share with you in this conversation because it's so heart blowing and mind breaking. Oh, I just, I just made those words up. That's kind of cool. Heart blowing, <laughs> heart blowing and mind breaking. Um, that our biological uh, capacity to have a concept of time is, is unique to our species or so we believe. And as a result of that concept of time, we have then developed things like efficiency, right? Cause there are things to do. Well, if I can get them done sooner, I'll get ahead of everyone else. Unfortunately, everyone else has caught on. So now everyone's trying to do them as quickly as possible. Yeah. And so no one's really getting ahead. But what he says is that the closer that we make two points, the more similar they become. So if you want there to be value in your destination, you have to let it lie where it lies. Stop trying to make the damn thing happen faster. Because mm -hmm. if you make it happen faster, it's gonna be less exotic. If there was a way for me to get to Hawaii from New Jersey in a half an hour, Hawaii would become New Jersey. Yes, yes. They wouldn't stay Hawaii. So, but I have to be aware of a biological drive I have to make everything happen. And so when I heard that, the moment I heard it, I was able to, in that moment, listen to the verbiage again, let go of some piece of my own internal resistance to where I was in my life. Because I still harbor a tremendous amount of potential to judge myself and judge my experience, which is a form of resistance, right? And so as I read that, I just kind of let go and I was like, oh my God. So it's possible that this difficulty, this sense of resistance, this moment of rebirth and rebirth and rebirth and rebirth, maybe it's all a sign that my destination is so friggin' exotic. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So maybe I can find value in this because where I'm headed is really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the spring wouldn't have its beauty if winter wasn't so long. Dude, I remind myself, and nature is the perfect teacher. For always, me. always. Dude, like I've been going to the park every day forever. And man, it's, it's a lot more beautiful now because it would look like in January. You know, it's incredible. And to sit with that and be like, all right, I've got about 180 days of this left. I'm going to make the most of each one of them and experience the beauty until it goes away. And it's funny to realize that's also a metaphor for like your own physical capacities. And your 100% own life, 
It's yeah. just not to say if you can make that same comparison to death, dude, then you've got it. Then you've, then you've got it. If you could really feel the ticking of the clock, really feel it, which we just don't do in the West. We deny death. We talk about there being a life after and everyone's going to be happy. We put makeup on dead bodies. Like we don't want to acknowledge it. And as a result of it, we don't live. Yeah. Because yeah. we think we've got all the time in the world. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I thought about coming up, I thought about making this word up. And, uh, Do it right ahead. now. Go for it. All right. So the word is going to be covidiate. And okay. <laughs> to, to covidiate is to recollect with all the capacity you can the suffering and the loss and the fear um, of this COVID experience at some point in the future so that before you bitch about something, you covidiate on it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm you really internalize it and what most of us have because we're pretty comfortable i mean there's people out there right now two sick parents with a baby no one can leave the house like right yeah damn yeah people like saying goodbye to a loved one over a screen because a nurse has the heart to hold it in front of their face <sighs> i mean that's just like but we gotta let it sink in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. instead of trying to get all right let's open up a side hustle like you know the, the success porn would have you do like no skip over the ugly stuff like it's, yeah. that shit hurts way too much <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. um and so that maybe someday we can truly but we we haven't done it we haven't done it with the holocaust we haven't done it with slavery we don't give those things enough respect mm. this is nothing compared to those things mm. Yeah, because people who have a little bit of money and a little bit of influence are involved now we got the military involved we got we got, you know, fire trucks going up and down saying thank you to people. Holocaust and slavery. I mean, exponentially, immeasurably greater than what we're going through right now. Mm -hmm. Yet most of us don't have any space for consideration about that, do we? Yeah. In fact, yeah. many of us would expect the folks who are, the, who are members of the lineage of those sufferers to get over it. Get over it. Yeah. Why would we want to do that? Why would we want to get over it? You so then, I mean? all right if we we most of us have this natural inclination to flee from those negative emotions right to not feel the sadness mm -hmm. someone like say myself a year ago without your influence who naturally flees from that how would you encourage someone to learn to sit with that and accept it and go through it and come out the other side i, I like the word encourage but in, where i sit in my practice today that I would probably only do it if I was invited to. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's my place to throw a glass of cold water on a sleeping child. I just don't think that's my place. Mm -hmm. I'd have to, I would have to check my motives if I did. Like, why? Do I need everyone to be awake? Like, do I think I know the purpose of this whole human experience? That we're all supposed to be awake? I don't know what the purpose. If we weren't, if there was no asleep, there could be no awake. They both have value. Mm -hmm. Literally, they both have value. It's the same thing as I said before. If I try to expedite your waking up, I'm making being asleep and being awake more similar. Mm -hmm. It has to happen under its, on its own accord. But if you invited me into that conversation, all I could do, and on, on a good day, all I would do is sit in your presence as a human who is however open I am to those emotions. And your body would recognize that and, and potentially accept the invitation. That's how it happens. It won't happen with spoken word. It'll happen by you and I creating a relationship that's so meaningful that all of a sudden you start to feel something when you're with me then. What the hell is that? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I didn't do anything. I just was who I was. I was to whatever degree of, of nutrient, I, you know, whatever nutrients my mud holds, to whatever degree my son um, expresses warmth and my rain um, brings what it brings that I bring that experience to you. And then the seeds that live in you are nourished by that. Yeah. Like they're nourished. They're nourished by the relationship. Sometimes they're nourished without you even, you know, there are people who, who don't invite the experience, but you know, you sit in the presence of a, of a fully enlightened being. I mean, I've been in the room with the Dalai Lama before, you know, it's palpable or people who met Christ. That's why they were healed. I do believe it happened because he was operating at yeah. such a high frequency they didn't ask for it mm -hmm. and it wasn't expediated for everybody in fact some people killed them yeah so if jesus wasn't capable of doing it <laughs> why yeah. Yeah. god's name would i or you if buddha wasn't able to you know if martin luther king jr wasn't able to mama gandhi wasn't able to mm. 
So it, 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 that allows me to ease up on myself. And I would bring to Chris my own broken heart, be yeah. available to my own broken heart. And we know that your heart and my heart would communicate. And perhaps your heart would go, hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's how, yeah. that's how it would happen. I don't want to pitch it though. So many people are pitching it. I don't want to pitch it. Mm -hmm. We keep yeah. pitching it. We, we just, listen, if, if Chris, if for you to become the man you are, you had to do what you did. Why would you spend any time trying to stop other people from doing what you did? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like you're cheating them, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And dude, that's the whole, that, that is the trap of like, all right, I want to play the role of a servant and alleviate suffering, but mm -hmm. that's their mud. I mean, you <laughs> Feeling an opportunity from them. So it's like, all right, I want to sit lovingly and watch you suffer. I'm here for you if you need it, if you need me. Like, but just but just by having that level of awareness, when you bring that level of awareness to the person, you just invited them to see the difference between the mud as it truly exists and the quicksand that the ego has created. So just by being aware of the potential to rob someone of the mud, you won't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The danger is when people don't see it at all and they think they're supposed to rescue. So you know? when, I mean, cause I did, I, I still do that right often, but I don't do it a hundred percent of the time, but maybe like three years ago, I operated like that a hundred percent of the time. Like I'm right. I know where we should go. Follow me. You know, yeah. <laughs> feels good. Doesn't it? In hindsight, it felt terrible. <laughs> I didn't know it though. It felt great. I know. So, <clears throat> At what point in your life were you able to make that switch? Because there had to have been a time in your own evolution where you were the guy on the stage raising your hand, thinking you knew what you were talking about. But we still are in some regards. I get, paid to, I get paid to do it. I know, right? So what has allowed you to make that switch where you can sit with the mud and the lotus and just, hey, I love you, go through such it. A, such a, you're such a brilliant man. You're such a brilliant man. You're very so, for, so first of all, it's a decision that needs to be made a million times a day. Yeah. That's the answer. I haven't been able to. Mm -hmm. I hope that I can right now. Yeah. And, and right now. And right now. And I feel as if I can, because as I say that to you, there's this softness in my chest. This is where I can feel it, but I'm not attached to how it's being heard. I'm just being me. And that's why my, my work and my clients have likely saved my life. I tell them some of the best stuff I'm doing right now is being done in situations like this where it's just conversational. I don't know where this shit's coming from, Chris. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. have a clue. Yeah. And, it ain't, and it ain't mine. It ain't mine, but that doesn't mean I can't be proud of it. And by being proud of it, it doesn't mean I'm robbing you of the capacity to be proud of what you bring. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm claiming more of something that there's a limited degree of. I want everyone to feel the freedom that I'm feeling right now. And so that it will never, it will never become arrogance if my immediate instinct is to share it because I don't want arrogance. I've had that feeling before and that's a separating feeling. It's a very lonely feeling. Mm -hmm. So the truth is that we have to make the decision to let go over and over like the surrender experiment. Like the word surrender is a really good one because yeah. you're doing it anyway. The people who don't think they, you know, you're doing it anyway. You don't even put yourself to sleep. You can't put yourself to sleep. If you try to sleep, you won't. You have to let it happen. You can't wake yourself up. You can't beat your own heart. So if everything that creates the opportunity for you to be Chris is given to you, how much of Chris can you really take credit for? Bro, right? I mean, it's all been given to us. So what do you do? What does one do with all this given stuff? One puts one's hand in the water and gently turns one's fingers. And that's the influence we have over the raft. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's real. It's real influence. Yeah. And for some of us who have big hands and small rafts, it might result in these really sharp turns. So we start feeling like, hey, I have, I have some real influence over the direction of this raft. But some of us were born on rafts that are like a piece of paper and a, and a, a stick. So we're hanging on and the river is raging. And some of us were born in these slow moving streams on yachts. Like that's not anybody's who deserves credit for that. That's karma. By that's what it, that's what it's meant by karma. That there are forces at play here, consequential forces from an uncountable number of, of, of causes and conditions that have brought me to, to be where I am. I'm not, I don't have this grasp yet. I have it stated well, yeah. but I don't have it grasped yet. 
because to grasp it, one of the two things would result. One is I would finally really forgive myself. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, I would not need credit for anything. Yes. Yeah. And I'm not there yet. Man, have you read that poem? I think it's called Ozymandias. Are you familiar with that? No, please. So basically it's like these explorers come across the feet of a giant statue in the desert, right? And there's a plaque underneath. Now it's just the legs. Everything else is gone. And Mm. it's like, Behold, I am Ozymandias. All you see is mine. I'm the ruler of kings. I'm the greatest there is, you know, like bask in my glory. And it's just these feet rotted away in the middle of a desert. That's awesome. That's what, yes. that's what we're doing. Like, oh, I, I can't tell you how many times I would sit in my bedroom, like, and say I, I one of the books I would write and it wouldn't have been written like early on. It wouldn't have been written from the best place. It'd be like ego gratification. Mm-hmm. And I would like look at this thing and I would just rip it apart, you know, as like a sort of cathartic experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, dude, because th- there's that natural inclination to just want to be significant. I mean, that's one of Tony Robbins' six human needs. He talks about it all the time, that we have this burning desire to be significant. But when you realize that you and everyone else are part of the same whole, like you're mm-hmm. inevitably significant. Mm-hmm. There, there's so, one. So let's let's rather than deny its existence or or negate it or, or or deify it or demonize it, just recognize it and perhaps there's a reason for it. it. As you were having that conversation, I felt myself which which doesn't happen as often as I would like it to, but who am I? You know, it this deep seated desire to recognize that the one thing that has you know unending infinite value is spirit is awareness and the best way to demonstrate that is by connecting to each other by just loving each other Mm -hmm. like really loving each other like when it hurts when it doesn't make sense yeah you know what i mean like just i can just forgive just forgive there's such freedom in it i have that's the higher level what drives us to that it's part ego it's part our desire I'm like, I'm a recovered alcoholic, dude. I like to feel really good. Yeah. Like, I don't, uh, my tolerance for feelings is, I need them to be big. Mm-hmm. That's who I am. It's not, it's not an entirely bad thing. If that's what drives me to the deep end of the pool. Yeah. So be it. Seems like there's room, there's reason for the deep end existing. So I might as well go see what it's like. Yeah. No, just for every one of us, it seems to be an intelligent way of looking at this is to just regulate the degree of tension that we begin to feel because the body will tell us when we are falling victim to the symph- the sympathetic versus the parasympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic is where the ego lives and the parasympathetic is where the spirit lives. And they're both useful. Um, but we happen to be in a world right now that invites sympathetic arousal more often yeah. than is necessary. You know, that there are the, the fact that certain things feel good seems to be good. Sex feels good. Eating feels good. It's usually a sign that things are working. When those things don't feel good, it's usually a sign that there's some form of disease. All right, so let's accept that and and see that as having some meaning. Now, how do we make those things menu items as opposed to full diets? Yes, yeah. That's That's an Alan Watts thing. So how do you make the menu items? Just menu items. Man, I, I've been doing a practice that actually I, I don't even think I've told Amber about. Every morning I wake up and I go to the bathroom and I put in my contacts. And if you pay attention to your inner dialogue the first time you look in a mirror with your shirt off, no matter who you are, it's never a, you know, it's never a pleasant experience. Damn, you're beautiful. <laughs> so I've been doing this thing where I, I put my contacts in and I look in the mirror and I'll watch the immediate negativity. Uh, that I've had my whole life, even when mm-hmm. I was like jacked out of my mind. Mm-hmm. And I won't leave the mirror until I no longer identify with the body until I accept it and love it. And I recognize this is an absolute gift. That's like a vessel for my soul. Mm-hmm. And some days, man, I look in the mirror. I'm like, I know who you are. And I'm out of there in like five yeah. seconds. <laughs> Dude, some days I'll be in there for like minutes, just mm-hmm. really working this thing through. And it's one of those mm-hmm. things I, I prime myself with each day. It's just a reminder that, you know, this, this thing doesn't have all the answers and it's probably leading you down the wrong road. No, it's, it's, there's, there, uh, there are many forms of thinking 
available to us. There's only one form that comes in words. Albert Einstein said he very rarely thought in words, that sometimes he would put his thoughts in words to communicate them. Yeah. My best thoughts do not come to me in words. In fact, as I speak, which seems to be what I'm here to do, this is not thought. Yeah. Yeah. I am not thinking while I'm speaking. It's a different form of wisdom. And you have other parts of other wisdoms in all different parts of the body. Gratitude doesn't come in words, yeah. but you're able to cultivate it and it changes that experience. But one of the things that I think you bring, that I know you bring to the universe, and it, clearly it's partially tied into the egoic pursuit of perfection and achievement, but it doesn't make a difference, is that you have the capacity to demonstrate for other people that before you overcommit to your soul cycle class and your 10 hours of consulting work and all this other shit, you might want to make it a priority to do what you do when you look in the mirror in the morning. If you ever expect to have any significant improvement in the quality of your life, you probably are going to be better off gaining 30 pounds, making 100,000 less a year, but having a daily practice that yeah. becomes sacred. Yeah. Sacred. And you do that incredibly well. Every time I talk to you, I'm like, God, I'm an underachiever. <laughs> and I, I, you know, like, I really have to make my practice more sacred. Like we've lost that as a culture. We don't have a temple. We don't, I mean, even in early days of Christianity, there was an hour of quiet time in the morning, an hour. Yeah. yeah. I'm a, I'm a teacher of this stuff. And I ask people to do 10 minutes and it's like, Oh my God, like 10 minutes. Right. Like it's, but if you want any significant change, you can't wake up and let that default operating system take over. Cause what you explain is the analytical mind, which is a disintegrating experience, which will never see things as good because good is a threat. If we see things as good, we begin to relax. That's a threat to the sympathetic nervous system because it's like Whoa, a tiger could come around that corner any moment. So it injects that critical thinking to keep us in a state of constant arousal because we're threatened. Except yeah. now we're, th we're threatened by our own internal voice. Yeah. Constantly. Such a great example. I used to do the library of the mind is one of the experiences I give people, which is exactly what you just like recollect the first thoughts you had this morning when you woke up. The most common one in most adults is U G H. U G H. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's the, that's how we greet another day alive. Right. That's I also prior to that, I won't get out of bed until I'm awake. Now I'm not awake physically. Okay, like I'll sit there like, dude, are you there? All right. Like, okay, let's go. And you realize it, yeah, last day possible could yeah. die right anytime soon. Like that little sense of like, holy shit, you know. And here's one of the best practices I've built into my entire life. I do not look at my phone until I am fully ready for whatever is on that phone. It's not going to remove me from my soul for the rest of the day. And bro, I you know if I get up at five, I mean I look at the phone until eight o'clock. You know whatever it needs to be. I won't. I won't welcome in everything in the external world, the good and the bad, until my internal waters are still. The, the, the name for that practice that I, I have put upon it is you have learned to expect the unexpected. So you, you prime yourself so that should the unexpected come across your, your bow, it doesn't shake you. Yeah. It's not unexpected. You got yourself right. You got yourself awake. There's even a practice I'll do sometimes where I will, because I've had some unexpected stuff come across my bow in my life that has been very much unwanted. <laughs> and, you know, because I never thought of it as possible, it was really, it really shook me, you know, but I'd like to say that I think as a result of my practice, when I had my stroke last year, I was not shaken, but yeah. I literally watched it happen. I was like, oh man, and had the wherewithal to look at the person sitting next to me and say, I'm having a stroke. And the universe happened to be so kind as to have that person be an emergency room physician. Yeah. I and mean, that's, that's just, no one deserves that. Yeah. No one in the world deserves that. And that was my experience, you know? So if we can begin to expect the unexpected, so I will be disappointed today. I will receive some piece of news that's different than I had hoped. Can I see the beauty and purpose in that? So that when it comes, I actually have the, the, literally the internal and karmic response of curiosity. That's when you know you're doing well. The curiosity yeah, yeah, over yeah. concern. Over concern. And that's, uh, that stuff comes up and you're like, ooh, so my businesses are shut. Let's see what we can do with this. <laughs> you know, let's yeah, see what we can yeah. do with this. Dude, and that's where nature comes in. Like, yo, if you stare at any tree long enough, it will baffle you. Mm. 
just the wisdom of this thing that doesn't try to be anything that one of my, one of my favorite practices is I'll go into a forest, especially ones that have old growth. And I'll look at like the little saplings growing out of the ground. Mm. I'll see the slightly bigger trees and mm. then I'll see the massive tree. And I'll think about how in many ways I'm this little sapling and how the sapling does not chastise itself for not being the massive tree, mm. but I do it every day. Mm. And then you see this massive tree that's just consistent. It just is a tree and over a hundred years it creates this beautiful thing that However, it's been, we talked about this last time. I don't view it as like, you are less of a tree because you're not the ideal tree. There is no mm. ideal tree. They're all perfect in their own uniqueness. But as a person, you know, my pecs are messed up. I am a mm. less ideal person. No, that's mm. my kind of tree. I'm the tree mm. that gets to jack up his body and figure things out. You know? It, and, you never, and you never blame a tree for failing to grow. No. Right? Right? But yeah, the tree doesn't have the agency to determine what soil it grows in. And that's where, you know, the human experience comes in because yeah, you're right. Yeah, but only, but only to some degree. That's, fair. But, all, that's but fair. only, but only to some degree, our freedom is limited. And anybody who doesn't believe that I will just ask them the last time they had to decide not to do something that they decided to do, like, or decided not to have an option that they had. Like it's, I never decided not to have an option that I had. Exactly. So all you know are the options that have been presented to you. And not everybody is presented with the same options, not yeah. internally or externally. There are some people who have never had the thought that this could be possible. Yeah. And even if they did, when they had that thought, how do I know what, what, what reaction their body had to that thought versus the reaction my body has to that thought? There is no room for comparison. None. Yes. Zero. Yeah. Yeah. Bring it back to me. Where, what are the soils I have available to me? And how different is it to stand in each, in each pot? And what, what grows and what doesn't? And how does that serve me? And how does it serve others? That's all we can do. Um, if we want to bring soil to others, I think we can do that. But the soil we bring is our mud. And I was having that thought as you were making that statement. Something I beg of you is to never lose touch, Chris, with your power to confess. Because you do what you do so well that you were very easy for people to emulate you. And that ain't gonna help anybody. Yeah, I appreciate that. That doesn't help anybody. What helps them is for them to know how difficult it has been for Here's you. Here's where I'm broken. Yeah, how difficult it has been for you because that's the one thing they can identify with. Mm -hmm. That's why the, the mud is the, is the universal. There's always mud. Mud comes before flower. Mud comes before flower. And there are some people who have no flowers because they've been fighting so hard not to be mud. And so if we can just identify mud, that's when, that is finally what I realize my purpose is. I don't trust you until you talk to me about your mud, bro. Because mm -hmm. if you want to show me a flower with no mud, I know it's either fake or you stole it. Yeah. And, if, and it ain't going to live very long if it's not attached to anything. So if it is real, it's going to be very short lived. So if you want to show me your flower, you damn well better be ready to show me your mud. Or I, I don't know what the hell it matters to anybody, but just I ain't going to let you in. I guess that is a perfect way to come full circle to the idea of allowing a space where people can forgive themselves is maybe mm -hmm. one of the best gifts you can give people. That's where it's it. like, bro, here's the mud. Here's your mud. That's, That's where it. we're at. That's it. I was actually I was actually thinking about doing a post, but I didn't want to assume some position of, of, of righteousness. But I think we can all use someone to tell us that we're forgiven. Right. Yeah. Like you, all, you already are. And I know that you're, the, neck, the reaction you have to that statement, I just want you to know, is your experience of ego. Because when I say you are forgiven and you go, yeah, but that's ego. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. little, that little thing, that resistance, that, that whole, that feeling of being separate and no, you don't know me. You don't just, listen, if we all sat in a circle and confessed our sins, we'd be bored within a half an hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and I've sat with men who have confessed murder to me. And to hear them say, and I mean, confessed it, like they were charged with manslaughter, but the courts didn't realize that that was actually murder because there's a big difference between the two. Mm -hmm. And to the point where I didn't know what I was supposed to do with that information, but the fact is that he would already, was already sentenced. There's nothing that has to be done. Mm -hmm. Can't be tried twice for the same crime. Um, I checked with my supervising psychologist at the time and found out there was nothing I needed to do. But to hear someone say that and to be able to, in my heart, see, for whatever reason, probably because I have so much guilt as a part of my karma 
I said, I actually invited that person to my home when he was released. That's amazing. He came to my house and helped me do some work around the house. And I never, I never felt, I mean, he wasn't going to hurt me. I knew he wasn't going to hurt me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No chance. No chance. It was a drug induced event. Guy sold drugs to his girlfriend. His girlfriend died from an overdose. It was this big frigging thing. He wasn't going to hurt me. And just by doing that, I still keep in touch with him on occasion. There's no, and not that many other people in the world who were going to, I didn't think twice. And I'm not trying to take credit for it, but just trying to tell you how powerful it was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, bro, I appreciate that. And I know that you're an incredibly busy man. So I very much appreciate our time together. And I want you to know that you, you create a space for me, even when we're not together, but just that knowing that, you know, you're out there and we're connected and you pop mm -hmm. in my head off and you create a space for me to be and not get so lost in that Western achiever, you know, mm. you're not enough as you are. Um, mm. And I think to whatever degree I found peace with my own mud, I think you're a big part of that. So I just want you to know that I'm very grateful for the opportunities you've given me to come to a clearer understanding of myself. I, I appreciate that, but understand that it's only possible because you have in fact given me the same gift that you have been a part of my healing to what was likely the most painful experience in my life that you know about. And the fact that you're here still makes it all have purpose. So mm -hmm. you have, o I've only been able to do for you, Chris, what you've done for me. That's the way it works. I appreciate that. So all right, dude. Um, appreciate it. Man, I love you. Thank you. I, thank love, you. I love you. Great. I love you too. I didn't even notice what we were doing other than having a conversation. That's why I think this is the platform that I most appreciate because it's just you and I. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. All right, man. Um, so how can people find you so they can get connected to you and have access to everything it is that you were doing? Uh, my website, augustlemming.com is easy. Um, Instagram, it's at August Lemming. And then Facebook, it's at Dr. August Lemming. And um, as time goes on, I will likely be doing more of this because it seems like it's where I'm, where I'm at and people kind enough uh, like you to invite me. So I'm always willing to take any kind of requests for anything. And I'm also um, in the business of working with people individually and organizations as well on this stuff. So that's what I do. My man. All right, sir. Um, dude, I have nothing else to say. I love you and I appreciate it. I'm sure I will listen to this and walk through the park and be in a better place because of it. So thank you. Thank you. I, I, I look forward to being within six feet of you at some point soon. Dude, can't wait. That'll be awesome. <laughs> Someday I'll even give you a hug. Oh, amen. Remember hugs? All right. Thank you, brother. Thank you, man. We'll talk soon. All right. Be well. All right. You too. Now I got to figure out how to get out of this thing. <laughs> oh, let's see. I